In this brief video, we will talk a little bit about neuroscience as it affects literacy instruction, reading instruction, writing instruction, as well as your instruction of second language learners. A quick word of caution, this is going to be a brief overview. It's not going to be um, all encompassing in the field. It's not meant to be. And also there are many, many books out there about brain-based research. Um, I recommend maybe even contacting me before you purchase some of them because some books are excellent, some books are um, not so good, a little bit flim flammy, if you know what I mean. Um, George Ruby, um, H-R-U-B-Y, I strongly recommend, uh, for instance, on this topic. Uh, but there are some people who just simply put the term brain-based or cognitive um, in front of the name of a book and they and it's really not brain based at all and it's really kind of frankly i don't recommend it uh, for instance ruby Payne um on a framework for understanding poverty um has now uh put the term cognitive and claims that her approach is brain based when frankly it's really not uh, that I can send you articles, and in fact, I will post some supplementary um, stuff about her work uh, that you need to be aware of, and I strongly recommend staying away from it. So be a, a careful consumer of goods out there, because saying something is neuroscientific or saying something is cognitive or brain-based has become one of the ways in which people are making millions of dollars out there um, selling books to teachers. Some books are excellent, some books are not. Look into the background of the scholar. Make sure that this person truly is a scholar uh, because if you're going to really do something brain-based and neuroscientific, you really should know something about the neuroscience. Doug Fisher um, and Nancy Fry out of the University of San Diego um, have done some excellent work on the field of literacy drawing on neuroscience and they generally are scholars and I recommend their work. So just be careful a little bit as we get started. Okay, one important concept that you need to keep in mind that can inform your instruction is a concept called neuroplasticity. Um, in neuroplasticity, the neurons, or in other words, neurons are a term for the cells of the brain, possess biochemical pathways that make them grow and reach out to other neurons when they are active. When we practice something, for instance, practice a skill in reading, the neurons that control and drive that action fire repeatedly. If a neuron fires frequently, it grows and extends itself out toward other neurons. Neurons that fire more frequently will also reach out more frequently. So again, this is a research uh, brain-based reason why you can genuinely say that when you practice something and drill something, you will uh, gain greater neuroplasticity in something. So what does that mean in second language learning, for instance? It means that the part of the brain uh, the neurons that will fire up more actively for the language that the students are trying to speak need practice. They need drill. They need to be fired up. One reason why um, older students uh, have a harder time learning a second language than younger students is because the appropriate neurons related to that particular language they're trying to learn as a second language are not active uh, and if you as you know if you don't use something you lose something not literally lose something when you talk about the brain but it's more inactive um, it's and so you need to get these neurons active the more you use something the more active it becomes that's true for any of us uh, the type of work that i do a uh, qualitative research teaching dialogue uh, reading, writing, uh, the neurons in my brain are likely to be active in that area. But there are other areas where I'm less active. Um, I don't do all that much statistical analysis. If I do work with a scholar that's involved in 
Um, if, if I work with a research project that involves statistics, I genuinely speaking need a partner uh, to do the statistical analysis part. That's among other reasons, partly because uh, the neurons related uh, to doing statistical analysis aren't really, haven't really been fired up in a while, to say the least. Um, so I need work. Uh, so again, think of neuroplasticity, think of uh, firing up neurons. And this does relate to what um, they're trying to tell you in schema theory uh, with information processing, because what's part of what that's telling you? It's telling you that we need to build connections between um, the prior knowledge and new knowledge. That's neurons firing up and making those connections when we talk about the brain. We also know, still with neuroplasticity, that fluid cognitive skills such as working memory and reasoning are critical in literacy. Um, and again, think of that. Think of what you're trying to do when you read. Um, and especially if you're trying to read a new foreign language, one that's a little bit difficult for you at first, you're trying to take all of this information that goes from sensory memory into short-term memory, and then it uh, goes from short-term memory into long-term memory, and you make use of it making um, with working memory as you process it, and then you uh, can go into communication. All of that stuff takes very active neurons. You need to be fluid. And it takes work at first because when you're not used to something, one reason why your brain will struggle when you're not used to something is that those the appropriate new neurons are not fluid. The more you use your neuron, neurons in a particular area, the more fluid they become. The less you use them, the less fluid they become. Uh, so, you know, very hypothetically, uh, one reason why if you take I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you've take, taken as little as two to three weeks of vacation away from doing something, um, yes, your energy may be charged up. If, you, if you've uh, taken a break, and maybe you can regain your, your physical energy, but inside your brain, it's just a little bit less fluid, so you have to kind of get those neurons more fluid again. Um, with students who go on a summer break, among the reasons why there is that so-called summer gap is because the appropriate neurons aren't as fluid anymore. So it's important to make connections inside the brain, and these actual connections, the neurons, can change with new use. You actually are literally forming new connections with your neurons, and you actually are uh, making your neurons more fluid with, uh, with more use. Your brain literally does change shape. Your, your brain literally does make new connections as you learn. The research um, on neuroscience uh, in literacy is based on the underlying premise that it is important to teach and provide literacy experiences to such an extent that the brain structures are changed and enhanced. You always want to work on connections when you're building um, second language literacy or literacy in general. How can you build those connections, the schema, the neurons? Okay, so we know that Emerging abilities in literacy, whether you're talking about uh, young children or more complex forms of literacy with older children or learning a second language, rest on changes within the brain systems that allow visual symbols to be fluently and precisely integrated with other functional brain systems. So again, that's all about the connections. Synapses convert the isolated neurons into a network of neurons. So again, a neuron might be isolated, then it forms networks, and then eventually more connected networks, and they become fluid. And once these neurons are deeply interconnected through prior knowledge, they're fluid, they're fluid and they're operating smoothly, boom, you're on to something. Neurons send signals back and forth through millions of synapses. These networks are the physical equivalent of knowledge. The change in the connections that make up the networks is called learning when we talk about the field of neuroscience. So again, it's all about building the connections. That's very much in line with what information processing is trying to tell you about the importance of connecting new, law, new knowledge to prior knowledge. 
uh, when we talk about learning and emotion. Remember back, uh, and this draws on, remember what uh, Rosenblatt with the transactional approach to literacy is talking about with the efferent and the aesthetic. Efferent meaning you're looking, you're reading for the purpose of gaining the facts, gaining the knowledge, gaining the, uh, gaining the truth. Aesthetic, you're looking at the artistic, the beauty, the emotion. Um, and what Rosenblatt was saying is that each of us, when we read a text, we take predominantly one stance or the other. We're either reading it predominantly for the efferent or predominantly for the aesthetic. And that is too, I'm willing to bet that when you read these slides on your own, for instance, you're reading it for the purpose of efferent, getting the facts, getting the knowledge. I doubt that you're getting much aesthetic value out of these slides. I didn't write them for the purpose of you finding them artistic and beautiful. Um, that would be weird if I did. But at the same time, uh, what we also know uh, from learning theory, the learning sciences, and neuroscience is that learning and emotion are linked. Um, they're very much intertwined. We know that if you're experiencing negative emotions, it will block the neurons. If you're experiencing positive emotions, the neurons will fire up better. When a neural network connections are triggered by emotions, synapse strength is modified, either for the better or for the worse when it comes to learning. Um, the responsiveness of neural networks can be dramatically changed with emotion. So that's why it's very, very important to consider the aesthetic and the efferent uh, when it comes to uh, what you're reading and what your students are reading, if they find something aesthetically pleasing, they're more likely to get engaged and learn from the reading material. If they find something aesthetically non-appealing, they're less likely to get engaged. Same thing with other forms of learning. If you are experiencing fear or intimidation or hate, or you dislike your teacher, or you are convinced that your teacher doesn't care, those are all negative emotions that have the actual impact of um, modifying your neural network connections in a negative way so that you are less likely to learn. Um, by contrast, positive emotions, um, trust, for example, joy, um, those will have the impact of modifying your synapse strength in a positive way so that you are more likely to learn. Keep that in mind with your students that you teach. That's especially important to keep in mind with this COVID-19 situation. If you find yourself now or in the future uh, teaching in a situation where your students are under high stress, under trauma, trauma uh, can uh, negatively impact synapse strength in a very serious way. And so it's important to keep in mind ways of lessening the trauma and ways of adapting toward more positive emotions. Okay, so what we know is that uh, and it's important to engage the whole brain, the entire brain, relatively speaking, because we only use them a, a, a relatively minor part of it. Uh, this involves engaging the cerebral cortex, which is the part of the brain most closely associated with cognitive functions. Uh, but you also want to use um, all four areas of the cortex for deeper learning. So again, I'm focusing here on the cerebral cortex. Uh, the more the brain areas we use, the more neurons fire and the more neural networks change and thus the more learning occurs. Uh, so again, this goes toward what we're talking about in uh, learning theory about the importance of multisensory. It goes toward the importance of the artistic as well as the visual, it goes toward uh, using all of the language arts because you want to use all four areas of the cerebral cortex. The sensory cortex deals with getting information, the truth, retrieving information. The integrative cortex near the sensory cortex deals with making meaning of the information, integrating it. 
The integrative cortex in the front of the cerebral cortex deals with creating new um, ideas from these meanings, the connections. And then the motor cortex deals with acting on those ideas. So what does that mean? It's important to consider when you teach your students, how are they getting the information input? Um, how are they making meaning out of the information? How are they creating new ideas? And then how do they put that into action? All of that needs to be considered. And that's one reason why you want your students to be active. It's not enough for your students just to receive information. They also need to make sense out of it. They also need to connect it with other ideas in a meaningful way, and they need to put it in action, maybe through writing or through communication or through project-based learning activities or through communication, through dialogue. Um, that's how all four of these areas of the brain get active. Just sitting and getting is neurologically not enough. So here are some implications for teaching. You want to create an environment of discovery for your students for the reasons we just discussed. You want to include modeling by experts, whether it is more expert students or yourself as a teacher modeling how to do things, um, or whether it is people from the outside. The bottom line is students need to see models. They need to see examples in action. Foster creativity foster multi-sensory experience. Um, this, um, the, remember the domains uh, within Bloom's taxonomy, the cognitive, uh, the psychomotors, uh, those shouldn't be neglected either. Foster joy, uh, practice, experimentation, problem solving, and above all, promote metacognition, reflecting on your thinking processes in a strategic way. You want to think about cognitive control. Uh, cognitive control involves, and again, this gets into metacognition, uh, mechanisms underlying the regulation, coordination, and, sequ and sequencing of thoughts and actions in a goal-directed behavior. So that's bottom line, a neurological way of talking about metacognition and self-regulation. Cognitive control is supported by a broad, uh, what's called frontoparietal um, network of brain regions, where both gray and white matter uh, show prolonged maturation into adolescence and early adulthood. So again, remember with your students, that frontoparietal uh, network, that still is growing, that still is being reshaped. What that means in a nutshell is that they are in an ideal place for learning, uh, meaning uh, or cognitive control is developmental over time into adolescence and adulthood. Quick word of caution, like I was saying earlier, be very careful, uh, you added the word very for a reason, uh, about using claims related to so-called brain research as shortcuts or easy solutions. There are, if you were to go on Amazon and put in the word cognitive or brain-based, I guarantee you will find a ton of books out there claiming to be brain-based. Um, if they sound like they're kind of self-helpy, um, be careful. I am not a fan of the self-help approach to teaching. Teaching is more complicated than that. Um, it's a lot more complicated than that. Human behavior, human learning is more complicated than some quick little self-help book. If it sounds too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. If it sounds too easy to be true, it probably is too easy to, to be true. Because I hate to tell you this, but teaching is hard. It's not easy. Um, and during your first year of teaching, if you haven't taught yet, because I've got, I'm making this video for a wide array of students who might eventually see it. Um, during your first year of teaching, you're probably going to stink. <laughs> I've got news for you. I was not a very good teacher my first year. Now, that being said, I was probably a better teacher than I remember myself being because I've had students who had me during my first year of teaching who've come up to me and said, oh, I learned so much from you and all that stuff. Fine, maybe I wasn't so bad. But, because um, I certainly fulfilled the contract of care and I was passionate and all that. 
uh, more passionate than it might come across in these videos because honestly speaking, I'm speaking in front of a computer screen. Uh, but, and maybe in time I'll gain acting skills and the type of skills that it takes to be highly engaged when I'm looking at some little dot cam on a computer screen. But the reality is, is that the type of things I'm teaching you in this course, I didn't know them yet when I was a first year teacher. Things about how to scaffold instruction and what neuroscience says and metacognition and self-regulated learning and all this stuff that we're learning in this course. I didn't know them yet when I was a first year teacher. And the little things that you learn with practice, um, how to adjust to classroom management issues in a calm manner, um, how to reflectively um, on the spot as a teacher, reflect about what I know about learning, what I know about learning theory, about learning science, what I know about cognition and brain-based research and neuroscience and emotion and in a heartbeat, uh, adjust my instruction in a positive way that helps students to learn better uh, while making the transition smooth. I didn't know how to do that properly in my first year of teaching. So I've got news for you. You might struggle a little bit when you're new. That's okay. Keep at it. Um, with reflection and with practice and with determination and with self-efficacy, uh, confidence in your ability to succeed, uh, you will get better. You'll be okay. Uh, just don't give up. On that note, have a good night.